Question number one from the Discord this week is, what do you feed your cat? My vet was offended when I told her I fed mine pumpkin mixed with a variety of human-grade meat. She claimed I needed to include grains and recommended some brands. Does a grain-inclusive diet make evolutionary sense for cats, or is this paralleling some human-grade medical and corporate incentive structures? Well, it is very important that your cat abide by the cat food pyramid. <laughs> the cat food yeah. pyramid has meat at the very top, and then more meat and meat and meat and meat. Mm -hmm. um, and then you want to give them something to wash it down with. So, which might be pumpkin. Could be pumpkin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I will. So uh, the idea that a cat needs grain is absurd on its face. Uh, we, in fact, uh, give our cats primarily tuna and pumpkin, canned tuna and canned pumpkin. We just give them a pumpkin. <laughs> Go at it. Um, and, you know, they don't, the pumpkin isn't something, like I can leave the pumpkin open on the counter and they don't go for it, whereas you can't leave tuna open on the counter. You kind of got to mix it for them to eat you it. Gotta, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll eat around the pumpkin, but they don't, they don't mind it, but you got to mix it in. Um, that said, uh, our 11-year-old cat, Tesla, our panther, w once when he was younger, got himself locked in a neighbor's house for 10 days. The neighbor... Uh, was not as daft as they seem from that story. They were, in fact, out of town, although we did call them and were like, is it possible our cat is like, nope, certainly not. Anyway, uh, after 10 days, it became clear, and I think we've said this on air before, that uh, Tesla had survived by finding all of the bread that the neighbors had in their house and eating that. And ever since, he has had a propensity for bread, and he is now an older enough cat uh, and was losing weight. And we have found that giving him bread as a supplement is the easiest way to get him to actually gain some weight yeah, in, a, in a good way. He prefers sourdough. He actually prefers Hala. He, it's Hala is his favorite, is his favorite, and uh, it's also Toby's favorite. And so Toby gets a little bit perturbed when he'll come out with like a half a loaf of sourdough that he's just going to eat. And I'm like, you have to share that with the cat. So <laughs> this is all going to be very mysterious to people who don't understand why we are doing things like feeding our cats tuna, which is obviously very expensive, why we would feed them pumpkin when it's not a native part of their diet and all that. So we, we should probably say something about that. Fair enough. A, there are all sorts of pathologies that pets are showing with respect to their food. I now increasingly wonder about adjuvants in the uh, conspicuously large number of vaccinations that are being advised for pets and whether they are triggering food sensitivities in the same way that I wonder if they are triggering food sensitivities in people. The suspiciously large number of repeat vaccinations for pets. I actually... I have not come yet to question any of the particular vaccinations. I mean, depending on what your pet is and where they're being exposed and everything. It's the <clears throat> now once vaccinated, they absolutely need a yearly booster, uh, which, you know, a, a good vaccine, a good vaccine shouldn't require that. And this, this, and I've said this here before too, a, a good vet said this to me a couple of years ago. I was like, why are you giving your cats all the same vaccines every single year? It's a good vaccine, which these are. Uh, they shouldn't, you know, at this point, you know, he said, you know, they, they probably don't need them at all ever again because they're fully vaccinated. Well, I don't, I don't know how to call it because it could be that these are garbagey vaccines and they require boosters in order to be effective. I have no doubt that they are being recommended to get vaccines that are not in their net interest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we know is we have an interest that makes, uh, we have a uh, an industry that makes money when people recommend or mandate that your pets get vaccines and of course they're abusing that so yep. you know that leaves us in the predicament of not knowing what, what a rational medical program would be for your pet mm -hmm. but nonetheless even if it has nothing to do with vaccines whatever it is is causing an awful lot of pet owners to face a situation in which their animals become intolerant of the food that they are eating. And if you've experienced this, you know that you then start sourcing more and more exotic proteins that your animal is not yet allergic to. And eventually you may find that there is nothing and your animal will expire from its inability to properly deal with the food that you're giving it. It's a terrible, terrible fate. And as far as I know, it is largely new. So yeah, something never heard of this back in the 70s, 80s. Yeah, that's possible. We didn't know it, but yeah. there's just something about this. So anyway, we have resorted to feeding our animals uh, something that they didn't grow up on, which was tuna. Um, and we mix in the pumpkin because one of our animals, uh, our older cat Tesla, 
has gastrointestinal issues and pumpkin, for whatever reason, for both dogs and cats, appears to be a curative for both too loose and too hard stools, yep. right? So a little pumpkin, we're just trying to keep keep the gut healthy. And the tuna, uh, so we used to feed dry food, but there's a problem, especially with male cats, where they get crystals in their urine that can block their urethra, and it can actually kill a cat if you don't catch it early. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a way of circumventing all of that, which of course, yes, it's much cheaper to feed your animal uh, whatever garbage food is being distributed, even even the good stuff has a lot of garbage in it, typically. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one incident where you rush your pet to uh, an emergency vet and they are kept for 48 hours eats up many thousands of dollars. And, yeah. you know, the alternative, putting your, uh, euthanizing your animal because you can't stomach the bill is an equally horrifying or more horrifying prospect. So, Anyway, we are being proactive, spending way more than we would like to be spending on food that we believe to be high quality. On a monthly basis, having having uh, not rushed him to the vet, or did we did we oh, take Tesla. him? He did go, but then we are we were able to pull him back before the, the costs mounted too high. Because um, they got him stabilized. We're like, okay. No, we're they were high. Yeah, they wanted but, to keep him for another 48 hours or yeah. something, and we were like, no, we can handle it. Yeah. Um but anyway, so in our cat's case, tuna mixed with pumpkin, the pumpkin they don't love, but they eat, and it does appear to be healthy for them. Um, but no, you don't need to give your cats grains. They're obligate carnivores, and they have become omnivores under uh, their uh, human association. So they're capable of dealing with a lot of stuff. Yep, as we are. Yep. Uh, we're, we're, of course, we're, we're omnivores. <clears throat> Humans are not carnivores. Um, dogs are more omnivorous, uh, you know, wild wolves from which our domestic dogs come, uh, have a pretty solidly meat diet, but you know, all of, all of our pet carnivorans, uh, that we domesticate, you, you, if you let them go outside, they'll, they'll chew on grass and such. So, you know, they'll, they'll get some sort yeah. of fiber in their, in their diets. Yeah. I don't know that they're digesting the grass. Probably yeah, not. Almost not. certainly not. That's in fact. Fiber. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I will say, though, that the key thing to remember when comparing dogs and cats is dogs have had something like 30,000 years of uh, evolution under domestication, by far the longest of any domesticated creature, the, uh, you know, by three times, because the other domesticated creatures were all subsequent to farming. Dogs not. They were hunting partners. And so that's an awful lot of time to um, adapt to humans. Obviously, there wouldn't have been a lot of grain involved in hanging out with humans until farming increased yeah, the rate. They're, they're, no, there, actually, was some, there was yeah. some wild har harvesting, obviously. Yeah, but, no, and there's, I mean, there's evidence. I think it's in, it's in one of the Chinese origins of, of agriculture places. I can't remember if it's north or south, and maybe one other place uh, where you have evidence of bread baking many thousands of years before any evidence of agriculture. Yeah. So there is grain use uh, and and grain grain preparation before agriculture, but it's not going to be at the scale. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was hit and miss because it's a low product productivity activity because the harvesting is so hard and yeah. because the grain itself is not evolved to uh, divide. So you throw away most of the harvested grain. It's mm -hmm. the inedible uh, fiber, and you recover only the, the endosperm. And the point is, under domestication, there's evolution for those two things to separate cleanly, right? Mm -hmm. It's in the plant's interest to serve the people. Um, but before domestication, it's a very labor-intensive, low-productivity um, uh, mode of, of getting calories. So anyway, dogs eat... Most of the things that people eat, and they yeah. do pretty well on most of them. There are some weird exceptions like grapes. Chocolate. Chocolate. Um, yeah. But for the most part, um, you know. Yeah, grapes is a weird one. It is a weird one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> um, so that's the long and short of it.